is heresy? Heresy is a willful denial of revealed truth. Heresy differs from apostasy inasmuch as an apostate abandons Christianity altogether, but a heretic denies only a certain portion of it. The heretic picks and chooses which teachings he will accept and which he will reject. The modernists of the Second Vatican Council advance the idea that a partial acceptance of Christian doctrine is better than rejecting Christianity altogether, and therefore, since heretics believe many elements of true doctrine, they are not completely cut off from membership in the Church. As this theory goes, Catholics hold to all revealed truth, and so they are in full communion with the Church, but heretics, on the other hand, accept only part of Christian doctrine and therefore they have a partial communion with the church. In other words, the modernists have rebranded heresy. Rather than being cut off from the church for denying revealed truth, heretics are now separated brethren, lacking full communion. For all practical purposes, heresy no longer exists in the Novus Ordo Church. I mean, people throw the word heresy around like, you know, it was uh, you know, a rash or something, you know, that you could think. <laughs> And personally, this is the Mother Tobin's oldest boy's definition of heresy. Heresy, in my mind, is an unwillingness to live with complexity. In the Novus Ordo Church, heretics are incomplete members of the Church, but members nonetheless. However, this opinion is false. To reject any part of revealed truth is to reject God's very right to reveal. It would be to make God's revealed truth optional, like a buffet line, one could just select the things they like and disregard whatever they don't. God reveals truth, and you decide what you will accept. The church has always held that to be a Christian one must accept all that God has revealed. Consider the words of Pope Leo XIII in his encyclical Santis Cognitum. Quote, the church, founded on these principles and mindful of her office, has done nothing with greater zeal and endeavor than she has displayed in guarding the integrity of the faith. Hence she has regarded as rebels, and expelled from the ranks of her children, all who held beliefs on any point of doctrine different from her own. The Arians, the Montanists, the Novatians, the Cortodecimans, the Eudicians, did not certainly reject all Catholic doctrine. They abandoned only a certain portion of it. Still, who does not know that they were declared heretics and banished from the bosom of the Church? In like manner were condemned all authors of heretical tenets, who followed them in subsequent ages. There can be nothing more dangerous than those heretics who admit nearly the whole cycle of doctrine, and yet by one word, as with a drop of poison, infect the real and simple faith taught by our Lord and handed down by apostolic tradition. In the Gospel of John we see an example where Jesus is teaching something that was hard for some of his disciples to accept. He tells them, Except you eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood, you shall not have life in you. And after hearing this, many of his disciples found this teaching so hard to accept that they walked away from him and followed him no more. Note that those who walked away were disciples who had already been following Jesus. They had already accepted everything that he had taught up to that point. However, they found this particular teaching hard to accept, and so they walked away. But Jesus did not call after those disciples as they were leaving and say, Come back. You can still follow me, even if you don't accept everything that I teach. Accepting most of what I teach is good enough. No. To reject any portion of Jesus' teaching is to reject God's right to reveal truth. Now there are many today who likewise find some of the teachings of Jesus hard to accept. But rather than walking away from Christianity altogether, as the disciples in John's Gospel did, they still claim to follow Jesus. Instead of leaving Christianity, they pick and choose which of Jesus' teachings they will accept and which they will reject. However, one cannot accept Jesus, but pick and choose which of his teachings they will accept. St. Paul tells us that the church is the bride of Christ. A bride cannot be partially faithful to her spouse. She cannot be faithful most of the time. She cannot have many elements of fidelity. A bride is either faithful to her spouse or she is not. This is why Pope Benedict XV writes in his encyclical Abiatissimi Apostolorum, quote, Such is the nature of Catholicism that it does not admit of more or less, but must be held as a whole or as a whole rejected. Heresy is one of the most serious sins because it challenges Almighty God's right to reveal. 
But how are we to know what God has revealed? From the time of the apostles, there has been disagreement among men as to how the revelations of Jesus are to be understood. Today, there are many who call themselves Bible-believing Christians, and most of them would agree that to be a Christian, one must accept the teachings of Jesus, and yet, one would be hard-pressed to find two of these so-called Bible believers who can agree on exactly what those teachings are. Consider the doctrine of the Eucharist. The 16th century Protestants, Luther, Zwingli, and Calvin, all agree that the Eucharist is a salvation issue. That is, they each taught that belief in the Eucharist was necessary for salvation, and yet, because their only authority was their own private judgment, they all disagreed with each other about what the Eucharist was. To be a Christian means that one must accept all that God has revealed, but without an authority, one could never be sure of what that revelation was. God's revelation cannot be decided by the whim of private judgment. Every man has a different level of intellect, and therefore, if it were left to each man's private judgment, no two men would ever hold the same faith. How could there ever be unity of faith if each individual is free to decide for himself which teachings he must accept and which he can reject? If we must accept all that God has revealed, it necessarily follows that there must also be an authoritative church to declare what those revelations are. We call those teachings that must be believed dogmas. There are two requirements for a teaching to be considered a dogma. First, it must be a truth that has been revealed by God, and second, it must be proclaimed by the authority of the Church to have been so revealed. Vatican Council Dogmatic Constitution Dei Filius quote, By divine and Catholic faith, all those things must be believed which are contained in the written word of God and in tradition, and those which are proposed by the Church, either in a solemn pronouncement or in in her ordinary and universal teaching power to be believed as divinely revealed. Note that revelation can be contained in the written word of God or in tradition. However, those dogmas that are contained in tradition are also at least implicitly contained in the scriptures. Note also that a solemn declaration is not required. The church can also proclaim a dogma through her ordinary universal teaching authority. A dogma should not be confused with a doctrine. Doctrine means teaching, and would apply to everything that the Catholic Church teaches, whereas a dogma refers only to those revealed truths that have been defined by the Church. Theologians assign classifications called theological notes to different Church teaching based on their level of certainty. For example, a doctrine of lesser certainty might be classified as proximate to faith, theologically certain, safe, or common theological opinion. To deny a church teaching of lesser certainty would involve a matter for sin. However, it would not separate one from the church. On the other hand, to deny a dogma of the faith is heresy. A heretic cannot be a member of the church because he does not profess the faith. A heretic is therefore not just a bad Catholic. A heretic is a non-Catholic, and this only stands to reason. For how can men who hold a different faith be members of the same church? There are those who assert that as long as a teaching is not a dogma, they are not required to accept it. But such a proposition was condemned by Pope Pius IX in the Syllabus of Errors. Condemned Proposition Number 22, quote, The obligation by which Catholic teachers and authors are strictly bound is confined to those things only which are proposed to universal belief as dogmas of the faith by the infallible judgment of the Church. It is not just dogma. A Catholic is required to give their interior religious assent to even the least of the Church's teachings. To deny a Catholic teaching that is of lesser certainty than a dogma may not separate one from the Church, however, it would still involve a matter for grave sin. But what about a truth that was revealed by God, yet never formally declared by the Church? For example, the Assumption of the Blessed Virgin Mary was revealed by God, but it was not officially declared to be a dogma until 1950. This does not mean that Catholics were free to deny Mary's Assumption before 1950. Mary's Assumption was a tradition taught by the Church dating back to apostolic times. To deny the Assumption before 1950 would have still been a mortal sin against faith. But when Pope Pius XII declared it to be a dogma, denying the Assumption now carried the additional censure of heresy. But what about those things which the Church teaches that are not part of Revelation? For example, 
when Pope Leo the Thirteenth declared Anglican orders to be invalid, it was an infallible statement, and yet the invalidity of Anglican orders is not part of Revelation. Church teachings, such as canonizations and ex cathedra statements, are truths that are not revealed by God, but are nonetheless proposed for belief by the infallible authority of the Church. Keep in mind that the infallibility of the Church is itself a dogma of the faith. Therefore, to deny an infallible teaching of the Church is at least indirectly denying the dogma of infallibility. If one were to reject an infallible magisterial teaching, it would not be heresy in the strict sense. As such, it would not separate one from the Church, but it would most definitely be a grave sin. But the argument is raised. What about a person who denies a dogma of the faith because they are ignorant of that dogma? To be guilty of heresy, it is necessary that it be pertinacious. That is to say, it must be a willful denial of faith. Heresy, like any other sin, requires an act of the free will. If one holds an error through no fault of their own, then there is no actual sin. This is called material heresy. In other words, a material heretic is just a Catholic who is honestly mistaken about some dogma of the faith. Now there are those who try to excuse the heresies of the Vatican II popes by arguing that their heresies are only material heresies, that is to say, they are just honest mistakes. But such an argument is untenable. First, each of these men have made it perfectly clear that they know full well that they are teaching contrary to previously defined Catholic doctrine, and second, their intention is not relevant. Heretics are not judged on their internal disposition, but rather on their public defection from the faith, and this only stands to reason, for how could the Church claim to be one in faith if its members could publicly hold two different faiths? An heir that is held in good faith and an heir that is held with full consent of the will, are both heir, and therefore, regardless of internal disposition, all those who publicly deviate from the faith are necessarily excluded from the church. The church is a visible society whose members must be identifiable, and Catholics are identified by their public profession of the same faith. Pope Pius XII, Encyclical, Missici Corpus Christi, quote, now since its founder willed this social body of Christ to be visible, the corporation of all its members must also be externally manifest through their profession of the same faith. To be a visible society, the church must be identifiable, but the church is not identified through traditional vestments. It is not identified through the external profession of piety. It is not identified by a Latin mass, or by titles, or by the possession of buildings, but rather, the visibility of the church is made manifest through the external profession of the same faith, and it only stands to reason that men who do not externally profess the same faith cannot be members of the same body. For how could a church be a visible society if its members could be divided in faith? Ludwig Ott, Fundamentals of Catholic Dogma, quote, Public heretics, even those who err in good faith, do not belong to the body of the church, that is, to the legal commonwealth of the church. Heretics, whether they are in good faith or not, do not externally profess the same faith, and therefore they cannot be considered as members of the church. But one may ask, why are all these distinctions necessary? Today we live in a world full of false teachers who claim to be Catholic, yet preach a false gospel. They pick and choose which teachings they will accept and which they will reject. These distinctions enable one to discern the true Church of Jesus Christ from these false teachers. Sacred Scripture as well as tradition tell us that Christ has given His Church four identifying marks. As we profess in the Nicene Creed at every Mass, I believe in one holy Catholic and Apostolic Church. Like a trademark, the marks of the Church are a means of distinguishing the one true Church founded by Jesus Christ from all counterfeit imitations. Consider the first mark, the Church is one. By this is meant that the Church is one in its faith, one in its government, and one in its worship. Christ willed that all men be saved and come to a knowledge of truth, and therefore He founded His Church as a visible society. To be visible, the members of this society must be identifiable, and the members of Christ's Church are identified by their profession of the same faith. Pope Pius XII, Michici Corpus Christi, quote, 
Actually, only those are to be included as members of the church who have been baptized and profess the true faith. Unity of faith and worship is not only good, it is something that is required by God's divine justice. It would not be just for God to require one form of faith and worship from some, and a different form of faith and worship from others. Therefore, for God to be just, He necessarily requires the same from all. A church that is not one in faith cannot be the Catholic Church. But what if the man who claims to be Pope openly professes heresy? Unity of faith is a mark of the Catholic Church. Can one be a good Catholic if they do not hold the same faith as the Pope? This is the dilemma facing Catholics today. All the men who have claimed to occupy the papal office since the Second Vatican Council have openly taught heresy. While there can be disagreement as to whether a particular teaching rises to the level of a dogma, we are not talking about the denial of some obscure or disputed doctrines. The post-conciliar popes have all in fact denied many of the most basic articles of the Catholic faith. They have denied the bodily resurrection of Jesus, the existence of hell, the necessity of holding the Catholic faith for salvation. They have taught that liberty of conscience is the right of all men, that all the baptized are members of the church, and that the plan of salvation also includes the Muslims. The list of heresies is indeed so long that one can become overwhelmed and fail to appreciate the larger issue. To stay focused on the problem, it is easier to focus on just one example. Consider that Francis has taught on more than one occasion that atheists can be saved. Now an atheist does not just reject one dogma, but rather he rejects all dogma. This is the synthesis of everything Vatican II has been leading up to. A humanitarian church where dogmas don't really matter, and even an atheist can be saved, as long as he is a good person. But if an atheist can be saved, there is no need to profess any faith. Jesus teaches, He that believeth not shall be condemned. But Francis teaches, He that believeth not shall be saved. It is clear that the Vatican II popes have all made a complete break from the Catholic faith handed down from the apostles. But if the Nova Soto Church has abandoned the faith of the past, how can they still claim to have the mark of unity? One of the techniques used by the modernists is to maintain Catholic vocabulary, but redefine the terms. In the Nova Soto Church, unity has been redefined to mean ecumenical unity, where all religions join together without conversion. Unity is expressed through interfaith gatherings. In Novus Ordo world, up is down, black is white, and joining together with heretics is unity. But the meaning of dogmas cannot change. They must be always understood as they were once understood. Vatican Council Dogmatic Constitution Dei Filius quote, That understanding of its sacred dogmas must be perpetually retained, which Holy Mother Church has once declared, and there must never be a recession from that meaning under the specious name of a deeper understanding. The unity of the Church must be understood in the same sense that the Church has always taught, and the Church has always taught that the unity of the Church is a unity of faith. As the Baltimore Catechism teaches, quote, It is evident that the Church is one in faith because all Catholics throughout the world believe each and every article of faith proposed by the Church. If one holds Francis to be the Pope of the Catholic Church, they must be one in faith with him. But to be one in faith with Francis, one must profess that atheists can be saved. However, to hold that atheists can be saved is not just heresy, it is apostasy. To be one in faith with Francis would put you outside the Catholic Church. On the other hand, to hold that Francis is a true Pope and yet profess a different faith than he does means that your church is divided in faith. Again, the unity of the church is an article of the creed, and a church that is divided in faith cannot be the Catholic Church. This is not a dilemma that allows for fence-sitters. There are some so-called traditional Catholics who try to escape this dilemma by acknowledging all the popes since Vatican II while completely disregarding their teachings. But this is not a position that is compatible with the Catholic faith. Consider that at every Mass, Catholics must profess that they are one in faith with the Pope, a priest who would offer Mass, one with the Pope, when he is not actually one in faith with him, is to offer a liturgy that is bearing witness to a lie. This is the dilemma facing Catholics today. Any solution that involves a heretic as your Pope presents an insurmountable contradiction. 
the only solution that is compatible with the Catholic faith is to conclude that Francis and his five post-conciliar predecessors are in fact non-Catholic counterfeit popes, and a good Catholic should give no more value to a counterfeit pope than they would give to counterfeit money.